a la gente está acostumbrada a ver y, y callar. Porque como uno a veces sabe que ellos llegan a perder su claro, y te van a matar a uno. También hay actores muy poderosos con interés en esta gran geografía abandonada que hacen que la comunidad esté sumisa, obediente y en silencio. The Gaitanista Self-Defense Forces of Colombia are today the largest armed group in Colombia by both numbers of people who are involved in the organization as well as territory that they control. In the last several years, the organization has grown from just over 200 municipalities to today nearly 400 with a presence in 24 of Colombia's 34 departments. The group emerged officially in 2007 from the demobilizations of several past groups in Colombia. When former members of the paramilitaries decided to leave that demobilization process and return to arms. This is an organization with incredible breadth but also depth within the society. It's a criminal organization but it's not just that. This is a group that has learned all of the lessons of Colombia's conflict and guerrilla insurgency in the sense that although its primary focus is economic, it has learned how to control, relate to, and ultimately silence the civilian population into accepting its presence. It's fundamental that the government clarifies a strategy to deal with the Gaitanistas. They control every aspect of daily life. Unlike the former paramilitaries who used to arrive into an area and often use violence as a signaling tool to control the population, the Gaitanistas have learned that it's far more effective to enter a community with promises. En los grupos. Hay muchas veces que le brindan dinero a los jóvenes. Y como son jóvenes que no están trabajando porque no hay de dónde trabajar, acceden a, a entrar a esos grupos por, por ganarse algunos dinero. No, como los jóvenes no tienen la oportunidad de salir a estudiar, eh, llegan los grupos aliados al narcotráfico. Y como ven que es la manera más fácil de ganar el dinero, les toca. No queda de otra. Esa es nuestra situación. La pobreza, la miseria, la exclusión social, el abandono, son el combustible que aviva el conflicto. Nosotros tenemos que compartir territorio con ellos. No estamos de acuerdo con su presencia, con su actuar, pero ante la ausencia de un Estado que garantice la vida, la honra, los bienes y la integralidad del territorio, el respeto del territorio, los grupos toman fuerza porque el Estado tiene una debilidad institucional. Yo creería que las autodefensas que hoy actúan no son meramente narcotraficantes, que también en algunos casos asumen el papel que el Estado ha dejado de, de desarrollar y por eso están allí. Y hay comunidades donde lo único que hay el que regula la vida de la comunidad son las autodefensas, porque decir en un pueblo abandonado que el alcalde es la primera autoridad, eso solo está en la Constitución, pero en la práctica manda el que tiene el fusil. Muchas personas ya no identifican de quién, de quién es la ley y quién no, sino quién la impone. Sí. Entonces acuden en, pues, a personas que no hacen parte de la ley ni hacen parte de, de miembros del Estado. Ya, de acuerdo. Exacto. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos, ellos pues, ejercen un control en la población. Entonces hay también personas que se sienten más seguros con ese tipo de personas en la región o en cierto mundo. Behind that strategy to enamor the population is the threat of violence. Anda uno siempre como que por la orillita, eh, hablando bajito, porque no sabe en qué momento pueda decir algo que lo pueda perjudicar. Con las fuerzas públicas, ni uno denuncia cualquier cosa. Ellos mismos dicen, aquí te viene a denunciar fulana. Yeah. So the sensation of living under Gaitanitsa control um, is the sensation of being watched constantly. Lo que te hace también que la persona aquí de la, de la comunidad que no esté en el gremio de ellos, que no esté a, a detrás de ellos, ellos, ellos miran a uno como enemigos de uno. Fueron buscando a personas, a los líderes, amenazándolos de muerte si, si hablaban. Es algo que, 
que es terrible, ¿cierto? Una sociedad así no puede tener un liderazgo, imagínense. Se hace liderazgo, pero con restricciones. Si pues, usted es líder, lo mandan a llamar, lo llevan al lugar de reunión de ellos y allá le hacen algunas advertencias. ¿Cuál sería tu exigencia, por ejemplo, al gobierno nacional? Pues que haga más presencia en los lugares donde estamos padeciendo este flagelo. Que haga más inversión social. No contamos con agua potable, o con un saneamiento básico, como alcantarillados. Esos son uno de los factores que, que también hace a que las comunidades sean más vulnerables y más permeables por los actores ilegales. Totalmente, sí, sí. The Petro administration came into office promising what it called total peace. Invocamos también a todos los armados a dejar las armas. And that strategy involved negotiations or talks with all armed and criminal groups in Colombia. The logic of that policy draws very much from the experience of 2016, when Colombia signed a peace agreement with the former FARC. Essentially what happened in the years following that is instead of filling the gaps, the state itself, armed groups filled that territory and expanded enormously. To avoid that scenario, the Petro administration argues that we have to talk to everyone at once in order to prevent anyone from becoming a spoiler. That promise from the government included the idea of speaking with the Gaitanistas. And initially, there was enormous enthusiasm from the organization itself. What's happened since is that the idea of sitting down with organized crime has run into a number of legal obstacles and frankly also obstacles in public opinion. Colombia has a long tradition of sitting down with leftist insurgencies, like the former FARC and like the groups that are sitting in talks with the government today. That means the ELN and splinter factions of the former FARC. The Petro administration, however, considers the Gaitanistas to be what they call a high-impact criminal organization. That means that the president can open a channel to the group, but the government can't talk about demobilization, justice, or other topics without a new law from Congress. Our scope for talks today with the Gaitanistas is limited. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it's impossible, especially to discuss humanitarian issues and possible opportunities to reduce the level of violence that are affecting communities in these areas on a day-to-day -day basis. The Gaitanistas remain essentially outside the total peace process at the moment, and that has ironically made them spoilers. The Gaitanistas are waiting at the gates to take territory from the ELN, from the FARC dissidents, from any other organization that decides to lay down arms. The resulting reality is that we have the largest criminal and armed organization in Colombia, with the largest number of members, the greatest territorial control, the greatest capacity for expansion, currently outside the strategy. This is an enormous risk because the Gaitanistas will take advantage of that situation. They will expand. They are expanding. One of the reasons there needs to be talks with the Gaitanistas is because they do control their troops. They could close the taps on violence. Dialogue could look like this. First, we need a channel. And there needs to be some gestures from the Gaitanistas to show that they can and are willing to do things like stop threatening social leaders, let state and humanitarian officials into their areas no questions asked. If we get that, and only if we get that, the government can start thinking about trading compromises. If the Gaitanistas pull their fighters from populated areas and end curfews, for example, the military pauses aerial bombings. This could go all the way up to regional ceasefires, written to protect civilians. The rules have to be clear. No extortion, no selective violence, and no confinement. One of the remarkable things about speaking with communities with a Gaitanista present is there is enormous public support for talks. And I think that reflects more than anything the dire conditions and the threat of violence that they are living under. Sí, 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 es posible. Pero es posible cuando el gobierno nacional se ponga en los zapatos de las comunidades. Ojalá sea posible en algún momento 
que exista una mesa en la que o se avance en los procesos de negociación entre este actor armado importante, porque no es un actor armado que no podemos desconocer su importancia. No podemos restarle la importancia que tiene este actor armado, pero tampoco se les puede mirar como simples narcotraficantes. Imagine how powerful it would be and the deep impact on society if we could work up to talks that see the Gaitanistas lay down arms. That's the long-term goal here. Now, we also cannot be naive or expect these compromises to happen by themselves. Colombia's security forces have a huge role to play in keeping the pressure on. The military and police also need to prioritize the safety of these communities who are forced to live under the thumb of an armed group and, frankly, up till now, have not been offered an alternative from the state. It's fundamental that the government clarifies a strategy to deal with the Gaitanistas. This organization has an enormous capacity to create violence, and this can only get worse. Without a clear strategy about how to counter their influence, both militarily, but also potentially in dialogue. Dialogue primarily and geared first and foremost towards improving the conditions of daily life, for the many, many residents of Colombia who are living in areas under their control.